Welcome back to another Q&A video. As always, everything is timestamped. If you have questions, leave them down below. So with that said, let's get started. What's the best way to do chess when you haven't got a spot? Okay, well, first of all, you don't actually need a spotter when you're training your chess. If you're one of those guys who needs someone to spot you whenever you do your bench, it means you're lifting too heavy. So my advice for you is to drop the weight down a little bit and stop ego lifting, okay? And this would include the dumbbell press as well. If you find that getting the weight off your chest is very difficult upon the first rep, but then everything else flies, it means that you're doing half reps after the first rep. Because the first rep was the only rep that was full range of motion. So drop the weight a little bit, you're not gonna require a spotter. Now that said, how do you bench for safety without using a spotter? Very simple, you bench press in a power rack with the pins set slightly below your chest, right? So when you have that arch, right? If you deflate, when the bar reaches really low, the pins should catch it. So that is the safest way to bench press hands down. And it's pretty much the only way that I bench the majority of the times if I don't have a spotter. If I don't have a spotter to guide me, I'm gonna bench in the power rack 100%. So that's what I would do for safety. Next question. Okay, there's a few ways that you could do this. My first recommendation would be to start doing the landmine press. Um, in 2016, I did a lot of landmine presses and my upper chest hypertrophied significantly. I saw really, really good chest development. And I think that's because, number one, the landmine press, your hands are really close together, right? So you get to squeeze the pecs really good. And also, it's like an inclined motion. So trust me, if you do the landmine press, you're definitely going to feel the upper chest working. You're probably going to get sore there. And you're going to see it developing right before your very eyes. So that would be my number one move right there. In addition, I would perform the paused overhead press. Pause the red press will definitely build your upper chest. So at the bottom, you wanna hold it for one, two seconds and then press back up. Trust me, trust me you can build a pretty good upper chest without having to do incline work necessarily. So those would be my two lists for you. Pause overhead press, landmine press. Next question. Hey man, I have strong forms but I suck at arm wrestling. Any tips, man? Yeah, you can have strong forms and a really good grip but arm wrestling strength is very specific, okay? Arm wrestling strength is pretty much isometric. You have to learn how to get strong in a wrist flexion position and how to be strong in the partial curl position. So my best advice for you is to simply start training like an arm wrestler. Start doing a lot of wrist curl variations. I really like the cables for doing this. You can do a wrist curl like this in a cable machine. You can do it towards you. Try to do a lot of wrist curls, right? Um, you can also do partial preacher curls, which is probably the best way of getting that arm wrestling strength. So take a heavy dumbbell, like 100 pounds or something, and just do quarter reps. Just do this. You know, you can even do it in the cable station. Just try to get some partial rep curls in there. You can even do um, dead stop pin curls. So instead of doing a pin press, well, you do a pin curl. You set it halfway up, and you're doing 90 degree barbell curls, right? Uh, all this stuff is going to raise your partial curling strength, because that's all arm wrestling is. Arm wrestling is, it's isometric. It's your isometric form and bicep strength and the curling strength because you're never going to be all the way extended in an arm wrestling match so you just got to train more like an arm wrestler and you should be good and then also uh consider doing some arm wrestling sparring if you're not actually practicing arm wrestling uh, you're gonna wreck you're gonna get wrecked by a guy who doesn't even do arm wrestling training like i know a friend that um he's 138 pounds but guess what he's hard as hell to be in arm wrestling i would say he's stronger than most guys that gym in arm wrestling he's literally he's 138 pounds he's a twig he's fucking skinny but he's very hard to take down because he's been arm wrestling for over 10 years. So sometimes you could be a great arm wrestler without doing specialized training. Just arm wrestling more will make you more proficient at it. So start getting some matches in and uh, I think you'll be happy with your results. Next question. How come when I do face pulls, I feel it more in my traps and my red delts? Yeah, you probably lack the mind-muscle connection, honestly. You haven't learned how to really hit those rear delts because when I do band face pulls, I just feel two things. I feel my side delts and my rear delts. Like it gets pumped like crazy. And when I do this lift, my development increases like crazy. My shoulders become much more healthy. Uh, my development like size-wise increases. So for me, it's always been a really good rear delt mass builder. Of course, it hits your traps indirectly, but that should not be the main focus. What you're probably doing is you're squeezing the traps way too much or you're rowing really low. You're rowing like down here. See, when I do my band face pulls, I'm pulling always to the forehead. I'll pull to the forehead and sometimes even behind the head, you know? So I think if you do that, you should see differences. And of course, maybe control the weight a little bit. Control it and try to like try to activate those rear delts. It's really just a mind-muscle connection type of deal. So that's my advice for you. Next question. You mentioned that you don't do squats for deadlifts, but what about deadlift stance box squat that George Lehman recommends? Oh uh, yeah, actually I tried doing that about three months ago and it had zero carryover to my deadlift. I actually lost strength off the floor. So I stopped doing them immediately. Uh, based off, I don't know, like everybody's build is a little bit different. But for me, squats do not carry over to my deadlift. It just does not carry over. 
And I think that's because I was built to squat. I have really, really good squatting leverages. So when I get better at the squat, that's all that really happens. I get stronger at the squat, put my deadlift sucks ass. In fact, the times where I did the most squats, my deadlift was the weakest. So for my weird anthropometry, uh, squats have very little carryover. And I just find that just doing more deadlifts seems to work best. When I just do deadlift, 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 hammer it hard with the frequency. When I do uh, block pulls, rack pulls, different variations off the floor, it just shoots up. But when I do squats to assist a deadlift, it just doesn't increase. So I'm one of those guys that I just I have to do more pulls. The more pulls I do, the more rows I do, the more posture chain work I do in the form of accessory work, uh, the higher my deadlift becomes. But squatting never carried over for me. I don't know why, but... I just, it didn't work for me. So that's it. Next question. I work in construction, so I'm on my feet all day long and lifting heavy objects. How many calories am I burning and how much more should I eat? You see, man, this is really an impossible question for me to answer. Like it's literally impossible. I cannot tell you how many calories you're burning from your job uh, because I don't know how strenuous the activity is. I don't know how long you're actually doing physical work. I don't know if the jobs vary from day to day. I, I mean, there's so many variables to consider. It's literally nobody on the planet can tell you how many calories you're burning from a construction job. It's just... I can't answer that for you. So my advice for you is to just figure it out. I mean, you're going to be doing this for a long time, right? That's your profession. How about you just learn more about your body? So yeah, man, I, I don't know how to help you. You're going to have to figure this out yourself. Look at your maintenance calories, do a little bit of math, experiment with calorie surpluses, calorie deficits. I mean, I cannot help you here. It's literally impossible. But I do know that you're going to have to eat a lot more now that you're doing this physical labor, guaranteed. So that's that next question. Alex, what are two or three special exercises for the bottom portion of the bench press? Aside from a pause bench, thanks. Okay, I'll give you a few ones. Number one would be the cambered bar bench press. The cambered bar is basically, it's a barbell that arches. So when you go down, you have extra range of motion. This is gonna build excellent bottom strength. Another method you could do is the illegally wide grip bench press. I know Louis Simmons used to recommend this. Uh, basically, you go for a five to six rep max, but you go outside the rings and you go really like, it's, you're, you're gonna feel your pec stretching a lot when you do this. Just be careful on the shoulders. Preferably use a suicide grip. So that's another method right there. You can do a lot of uh, dumbbell pressing from different angles, the incline dumbbell press, the flat dumbbell press, high volume, low reps if you want. And you can consider the low pin press. So even, even the close grip bench, because the close grip bench is a larger range of motion. So when you go back to the wide, the range of motion has decreased a little bit. So now you have a little bit more pop off the chest. So those would be my recommendations for you. Next question. Hey Alex, how do I maximize my trap bar deadlift overload after doing heavy squats? You see, I really don't understand this question. It's extremely vague, and I don't know what you mean by this. What do you mean by overload and after heavy squats? So I can only speculate. My assumption is that you have tired quads after doing your squats, and now when you go to your trap bar deadlifts, you can't lift as much weight because your leg drive sucks. So in that case, I recommend you just pull off blocks. Instead of doing the regular trap bar handle, right? Number one, do the high handle, so it's gonna be less range of motion, and also put it on top of blocks. Take some four inch blocks, and you're going to find that the bottom is a lot easier. So you're not going to be limited by your leg drive. You're going to feel it more in the upper back and the traps. So that's my assumption here. Next question. At what point in lifting career did the muscle gaining benefits of a bulk become outweighed by the fat to muscle gain ratio? So basically diminished returns from a bulk. And where do you go from that point? Yeah, you'll find this to be true as you become more advanced. Um, because the more advanced you get, the less muscle you gain per year. So when you go on these crazy bulks and you gain all this fat, not much of it is muscle. It's mainly going to be fat. So I would say guys who can benefit from these crazy bulks, typically they're going to be beginners, intermediates. But when you've really been training for a long period of time, it's, it's best to just do a lean bulk or slowly gaining weight over time. Like it doesn't make sense to go on these crazy bulks and gain all kinds of fat. You're just, you're not going to gain that much muscle anyway. Um, it might help you with your strength development. Your, measure, your measurements are obviously going to go up. So if you're at 16 inch arms at 10% body fat, you'll probably have 17 plus at 20% body fat. So your, your measurements are going to go up. But in terms of actual muscle gains, like strict muscle gains, doubt you're going to see anything crazy, you know? So you're mainly doing it for strength, if you ask me. You're mainly doing it for leverages, better recovery. But you're not getting much size out of it. Like, you'd better, you, like if you just did a clean bulk, very slight surplus, very small, and you gain weight slowly over time, I think you'll get very good results like that. You don't have to get super fat, if you ask me. So that's my take on extreme bulking as an advanced lifter. Next question. Yo, Alex, what's your opinion on the fat acceptance movement? Yeah, I don't think it should be accepted whatsoever. You should not accept being fat or being obese because it's not about the looks here. It's about the health. And the fact of the matter is that if you're obese, if you're medically obese, you have all this fat all over your body, you're going to die younger. Your life expectancy is not going to be as high. Your quality of life is not going to be as good. I mean, why would you want to live as a fat person? I don't 
understand that. You, I mean, listen, you should never disrespect someone just because they're fat. You shouldn't uh, treat them like garbage. Instead, you should seek to help them out. You shouldn't shame them, you know, but to accept it, I think it's the wrong move. I think we should teach fitness and make guys get lean, make women, men and women get lean. I, I just, I don't see the appeal in accepting that you're fat. Like, imagine I have a gut up to here and I'm like, you know what? I accept it. Fat is beautiful. No, nah, man, listen, it, it's not about the looks. It's not about that superficial crap. It's about your health. You're going to die younger if you're obese. So why would you continue to brag? Oh, I'm fat. No, man, cut your way back. You don't have to be shredded. You can be 15, 20% body fat. That's what I preach. You can be fluffy, but don't be obese. Don't be a fat ass. I mean, it's not good for your health. Your health is the most important thing. I don't accept that. I think it's a bad thing to be obese, to be fat. It's fine to be fluffy, but being fat and accepting it, that should not be tolerated. It, it just should not be tolerated. Fat is not, it should not be considered a beautiful thing. It should be seen as a disastrous effect to your health. So that's my take on it. Next question. How do I get huge glutes? Best way to build a huge ass is by training like a powerlifter, hands down. I know that when I do a lot of squats and deadlifts, my glutes get massive. It's like, it, it's actually insane, especially the squats, man. Do high volume squats. Get your squat up to a high amount. I'm telling you, your glutes, are, they're gonna have no choice but to grow. So I've always found that train like a powerlifter, exactly like one, whether you're running a minimal system or not, just the fact that you're doing squats and deadlifts and the relevant accessory movements that builds these lifts, I found this to be the absolute best thing in the world for building your glutes. So that's, that's what I recommend. You want a nice, you want some nice legs, nice posture chain, squats and deadlifts, hands down. So that's my take on it. Next question. Hey Alex, what exercise is it okay to cheat on your novice program? I was thinking about preacher curls, penle row maybe, etc. <laughs> there's no etc. And there's no cheating on any lifts in my novice program. Um, I designed it for first year lifters or guys who don't have a foundation, guys who have not reached the intermediate stage, and everything is meant to be done with perfect, flawless form. If you're a novice lifter, I don't want you doing a cheat curl. I don't want you doing a cheat shrug. I don't want you doing a cheat row. I want you doing every single exercise with textbook form. You have to do everything with perfect form. You can start cheating a little bit once you know your body, once you're a little bit more advanced. For me personally, I only started cheating when I was rowing between 275 and 315. And I had already maxed out the dumbbell stack with strict form. And I already had a really wide, thick back before I started cheating. It's just that when I started cheating, it got even better. Like it got really, really developed with all the weighted stretch overload. But if you're a novice, you don't have to worry about chi reps. It's, a very, it's, it's pretty much an advanced technique. Like it's an intermediate advanced technique. I would not cheat on anything. Just do everything strict. That's my take on it. Next question. Which lat exercise would you recommend if you can't do pull-ups? Is lat pull-down enough? Uh, yeah, you don't have to do pull-ups to get a wide back. Um, if you just do lat pull-downs and various different rows, even pull-overs, your lats should develop just fine. Uh, obviously, the way to pull-up is one of the best mass builders of all time for the lats, but it's not mandatory by any means. There's no exercise that you can say is like 100% mandatory, you know? So... I don't see why you would need weighted pull-ups. It's definitely going to help you if you can do them, but if you want to just do lap pull-downs and different rowing variations, I think you'll be fine. So that's that. Next question. My brother says he doesn't do barbell front squats because his wrists start hurting. He claims he's using proper technique. Do you think he needs to work on strengthening his wrists? Yeah, your brother probably has extremely tight wrists. And in that case, I would just do some basic wrist uh, stretching. Just have him uh, do this. Have him stretch from this position, you know, multiple times a day. You could even make him do this stuff. You know, it's very simple. You can put his hand on the wall and kind of twist and get that wrist action in there. Uh, you can even put your hand directly on a barbell and raise the elbow and really stretch out the wrist, you know. And if that doesn't help, like you could always take wrist straps, put it on top of the barbell and you could just grab onto the straps. That's what John Fung does. And he never really does the front squat in the clean position. But yeah, like if your brother's having trouble, the clean position hurts his wrist, it's because he's, uh, he has mobility prompts. So he has to strengthen them. And then one uh, final tip, Start doing uh, wrist push-ups. You can start off on the wall if it's a bit too hard, you know. Start doing wrist push-ups. I think you'll benefit greatly from it. So that's my take on it. Next question. Training with naturally enhanced at home gym, what are the essentials for equipment? I wouldn't say there's essentials because there's over 300 exercises in the program. There's a lot of movements you can do, whether you're in a home gym, a commercial gym, any place that you have. I've had guys with the most basic setup possible run naturally enhanced with great success. Um, so you don't really need anything. What I would recommend, though, is uh, barbells, dumbbells, maybe a power rack, although that's not up. That... What I would recommend, though, is maybe barbells, dumbbells, possibly a power rack. That's pretty much it. Maybe some bands, too, which is 100% optional. You don't really need much. There's so much variation. Like, trust me, when you see the program, you're going to be amazed 
at how much stuff there is. So, so yeah, you'll be good even with limited equipment. Trust me. You just got to be a little bit creative and I show you everything you need. So don't worry about it. Next question. Alex, do you ever let loose and drink? I mean, you got to get laid at some point. So how do you do it? Yeah, of course I drink. I drank last night and I pretty much have no restrictions when it comes to drinking. I mean, I'm never going to get drunk. I've never been drunk in my entire life. The most I'm going to have is like three beers in one session. But yeah, I do drink. I'm a social drinker. You know, if I'm out, if I'm out somewhere and someone offers me a drink, I'm definitely going to have it. Am I going to buy my own money? No. Are you going to see me in a bar? No. Are you going to see me in a club? No. But if I'm with some buddies, if I'm with a chick and we're having some drinks, I have no problem doing that. And actually, when I first did my 585 behind the back deadlift, I had wine right before doing it. I think I had two glasses of wine right before doing that fucking PR. So I drank. No problem. In 2015, I was drinking four times a week. And the reason why I can get away with drinking is because I'm not trying to be stupid shredded. So it's very, it, like, it's very easy. Did you ever hear a guy say, oh man, it's so hard to maintain 15, 20% body fat. It's not hard. If you drink what? Two, four times a week with a very small amount of alcohol, like you really think you're going to get fat? Like, I would say it's unlikely. So I just, I drink whenever it's handed to me, whenever the opportunity is present, I'll drink, no problem. And that's because I'm not trying to get stupid lean. So that's that last question of the week. Any tips on making social gains? I spend most of my life lifting at home and I have real issues talking to people and getting out. People make me very nervous. Thanks. All right. Well, it sounds like you have social anxiety. So the first thing you have to do is get rid of that problem because otherwise you're just going to keep staying at home, playing video games and lifting weights. So I recommend you go online and look up some programs that actually help with the anxiety. And a good one would be the Approach Anxiety System by Good Looking Loser. You can check it out on his website. And it's basically a systematic desensitization, right? which is a psychological technique which involves different progressions, various different states that you go through, and that allows you to overcome your anxiety in a gradual way, in a linear way, if you will. So I would uh, run that program for the duration that it states, and then after that point, you should be good, honestly. It's a very, lots of guys have had success with it, if you go on his form, and I would just give it a shot. And of course, you need to have a desire to improving yourself. Like, if you're not committed to going out and making a change, you're not, nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna change. At the end of the day, if you don't want it bad enough, nothing's going to happen. So you got to give yourself a kick in the ass. Go out there, start talking to people. It doesn't have to be bars or clubs, but it could be in the streets. It could be at the mall, your store, whatever, but you have to force yourself. Force yourself to speak to people and just make an active effort. Make an active effort. You're going to see that your nervousness goes down tremendously. And of course, uh, start reading some books. Read some self-improvement books and uh, try to become the best man that you could be. Master your commu communication abilities. Uh, maybe sign up to some group events or something, but point is you have to want it. If you want to improve your anxiety, you recognize it as a problem, and now you're going to remedy this issue, things are going to go just fine. So it's a good thing that you recognize you have this problem. Now it's a matter of attacking your weaknesses, which is this anxiety. But once you get over it, I think you'll be a lot more happy. So that's my advice for you. Hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A video. Give me some more questions down below, and I will answer them all next week.